Street Fighter 1, the beginning of it all, the pioneer of the six-button fighter. This 1987 release laid the groundwork for what would eventually become a worldwide phenomenon. A few years later, Street Fighter 2 took that foundation and crafted a game that would help the entire genre explode in popularity, and planted the seed of a competitive spirit in a fledgling fighting game community. Then came Street Fighter 3, a black sheep that didn't quite reach the financial highs of its older sibling, but still impressed with best-in-class gameplay and innovative systems that helped show the world to one of the craziest moments in gaming history. Years later, Street Fighter 4 introduced the series to a brand new audience while not forgetting what brought it to the show in the first place. Now, that brings us to Street Fighter 5, probably one of the most divisive games in the series so far. In this video, I'll tell you how Capcom stumbled with the newest version of their flagship fighting franchise and how they eventually turned it around. This video is going to be a bit different than my previous two. Reason being that with Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite and Street Fighter Cross Tekken, there was a lot of controversy surrounding those titles before they even hit store shelves. Street Fighter V enjoyed some fairly consistent messaging with a rather drama-free pre-release hype campaign. The craziest it ever got was some light criticism over Ken's jacked up face on the character select screen and Chun-Li's comically active uh, twins during the beta test for the game. But before we get there, let's start at the beginning. In 2013, the PlayStation and Xbox brands were ramping up to the launch of their next generation consoles, the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. While Microsoft attempted to market their next Xbox as a multimedia platform for your living room, Sony appealed to their new system's strengths as a gaming platform first and foremost. Sony reached out to studios like Guerrilla Games, From Software, Sucker Punch, and others to help craft high-quality platform-exclusive titles to cement the new PlayStation as the gaming-focused system they promised it to be. So when Sony approached Capcom to assist with the development of a brand new game, there was a little doubt that the next iteration of Street Fighter was on its way. Street Fighter V was formally announced to the world at the 2014 PlayStation Experience as a PlayStation 4 console exclusive. Sorry, Xbox fans. If you thought the Mega Man and Pac-Man situation from Street Fighter Cross Tekken was bad, you aren't even getting this game. After announcement, Capcom released a steady stream of information about Street Fighter V, from gameplay trailers, system breakdowns, character unveils, and even an announcement of a PC version of the game featuring crossplay with the PS4. One of the more major of these announcements was the reveal of Street Fighter V's universal battle mechanic, the Variable System, also known as the V-System. Named as such because each of the three different mechanics that make up the V-System vary greatly from character to character. First is the V-Reversal, a move that can only be used while you're blocking. Some V-Reversals push an attacker away, some can simply knock them down, and some could cause characters to switch sides. Next up is the V-Skill, a unique part of a character's repertoire of moves that can help them cover up some of their weaknesses or enhance their strengths. For example, Ryu got his parry back from Street Fighter 3. M. Bison got a move that let him absorb and use his opponent's projectiles against them. And Rainbow Mika, a returning character from the Street Fighter Alpha series, pulls out a microphone in order to talk shit to her opponent and increase the damage on her command throws. Next comes the big one, the V-Trigger. Once you've built up enough V-Meter by either blocking or taking hits, you get access to a character-specific move that can help turn the tide of a match. Much like Ultras in Street Fighter 4, V-Triggers were about as close as you were going to get to a comeback mechanic in this new game. I'll talk about V-Triggers a bit more later. At a panel during EVO 2015, Capcom signaled a major shift in their post-launch DLC strategy. They announced that they would be treating Street Fighter 5 as a service-based title, meaning Street Fighter 5 was designed not to just be any regular old game, but instead, their goal was for this title to be part of a video game player's everyday routine, meaning that they were designing the game around the idea that players could earn every post-release character for free by playing the game through an in-game currency system called Fight Money. They also planned for a premium currency system for costumes and such called Zenny, but that was scrapped due to technical problems and replaced with real money transactions in the Steam and PlayStation stores. And most importantly, all post-launch gameplay related content will be earnable by playing the game. In that same panel, Capcom explained that one of the design goals for Street Fighter V was to reduce the execution gap that existed in older versions of the series. 
They took steps to address this in Street Fighter 4 with the Ultra Combo system and relaxed special move commands, but they found that many casual fighting game players didn't stick around long enough to explore the depths of what their games had to offer due to a high execution barrier, specifically with things like option selects and one frame links. In order to combat this, Street Fighter V introduced a three frame buffer for normal attacks, meaning that even the toughest links only required you to hit a 1 20th of a second window instead of a 1 60th of a second window in Street Fighter IV. One last big announcement before Street Fighter V's launch was the unveiling of the game's narrative content. For the first time in Street Fighter history, there would be a cinematic story mode with cutscenes, voice acting, drama, rising and falling actions, and more. Easily the most front-facing story content that the series has ever seen. One small catch though, the single-player story, which was sure to rival some of the best pieces of media ever created, like Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Space Jam, etc., wasn't going to be available at launch. Instead, each character would have their own miniature slideshows giving context to them and their purpose to the Street Fighter universe. But now the time is finally here. It's February 16th, 2016, release day for Street Fighter V. So let's see how Capcom fucked it up, shall we? As is what seems to be a tradition with Capcom fighting games released after 2008, press outlets praised the gameplay of Street Fighter V, saying that the core Street Fighter experience is still alive and well in this new edition of the game. The common complaint, though, wasn't about what was there. It's about what wasn't. Street Fighter V was ripped for its bare-bones presentation and severe lack of content, especially when compared to other fighting games released around the same time. This was the first entry of the Street Fighter series to not feature any type of arcade mode. You couldn't even fight computer-controlled characters in a best-of-three round game. The story content that was featured in the launch version of Street Fighter V was limited to slideshows broken up between one-round fights against brain-dead easy CPU opponents. While fight money was implemented and worked as intended, you couldn't access the in-game shop to actually spend your newly begotten gains. Combo trial mode was an option in the menus, but was grayed out, implying that it was going to be added in a future update. On top of all of this is the survival mode. So in this dumpster fire of a mode, you face off against 10, 20, 50, or 100 opponents depending on the difficulty you choose. Each fight gets harder than the last, and any damage you take gets carried over to subsequent rounds. Between stages, you're able to buy one benefit that'll help you progress further, whether it be a defense boost, more health, etc. The mode itself is fine, I guess, but there were a few nagging issues that almost caused me to stop playing Street Fighter V entirely. First and most obvious was the fact that they locked costume colors behind completion of this mode. Color 3 was locked behind easy, 4, 5, and 6 behind medium, and 7 through 10 behind hard. As someone who was fairly active in his local fighting game community at the time and tried to have as complete of a collection of costumes and colors as possible for tournaments, I was forced to slog through hundreds, if not thousands, of these fights to maybe unlock a few colors for characters that I wouldn't otherwise use. Worse yet, you were only able to unlock one set of colors per costume per completion. So if I clear medium survival with Karin's story costume, I wouldn't unlock any other colors for any of her other costumes. That's unfortunate because this was one brutal, savage, unforgiving mode. Because if you lost once, you were done. Game over, you wasted all of your time no matter if you were on the first or 50th stage. You fucking piece of shit! Ah, you fucking shit fuck. Game's over. So between no shop, no real arcade mode, a general lack of options and gameplay modes, and a sparse roster of, um, of, uh... Hey, Johnny Maestro of the 1950s doo-wop band The Crests. How many characters did Street Fighter V have at launch? Sixteen. Oh, okay. Thanks. Anyway, there is some speculation out there that suggests that Street Fighter V launched in the state that it did because developers were rushed to meet the beginning of that year's Capcom Pro Tour, the long-lasting tournament series for Capcom fighting games. But content issues aside, let's talk about the real meat and potatoes. Let's talk about the gameplay. First, let's talk about Footsies, a fun game to play with your platonic friends underneath the dinner table. But in the context of fighting games, 
Fuzzies refers to the mid-range battle where you gauge your opponent's habits, measure distance, and try to bait them into making mistakes, which you can capitalize on, usually with normal moves like punches and kicks, and sometimes with special moves like fireballs. Usually, you want to do this with light and medium attacks because they come out quicker and recover faster. However, in Street Fighter V, there's something called crush counters. Heavy normal attacks that on counter hit send opponents into a crumple-like state where you can follow up with highly damaging combos. Combine this with what many consider to be stumpier than average normals for a Street Fighter game and a priority system that lets heavy normals beat out medium and light normals, and you get footsies in Street Fighter V revolving around using crush counter capable normals at a much higher rate than anything else, leading to a less robust neutral game where the advantage goes to the player who's able to land the first crush counter. Defensive play also took a hit. Not many of Street Fighter V's original 16 characters had great get off of me moves without the use of EX meter. If you had fireballs, you still couldn't play a safe long range zoning game because it seems like every character has some kind of anti fireball technique or way to get up on a foe who sits back and chucks plasma. As a result, offensive and rushdown oriented strategies dominated the early days of Street Fighter V. Even characters like Dalsim, with his stretchy limbs and slow arching fireballs, was much more effective when he was in your face mixing you up with teleports. The focus on offense caused a bit too much linearity in the gameplay styles of the original cast. Meterless wake up options were at a premium, V reversals are inconsistent and somewhat easy to bait, and without Street Fighter 4's crouch teching or invincible backdashing, Street Fighter V would almost always be stuck in a state of perpetual offense or perpetual defense, without many breaks for a neutral game in between, leading to a pretty uneven gameplay experience. Speaking of uneven gameplay experiences, V-Triggers could possibly be the poster child for such a phrase. Remember when I said, Much like Ultras in Street Fighter 4, V-Triggers were about as close as you were going to get to a comeback mechanic in this new game. Well, they aren't quite as free as Ultras, but V-Triggers were considered by many to be an oppressive, game-defining mechanic that had its own unique set of issues. For example, the power boost that characters got from their unique V-Trigger was greatly inconsistent, so much so that the lack of a strong V-Trigger often meant that you weren't as good of a character. See Fong and Zangief if you want an example of that. V-Triggers are meant to be good. But added with this game's extreme emphasis on offense and pressure, some characters could use their V-Triggers to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat to an extreme degree. Street Fighter IV's Ultra Combos usually only did around 40-60% to 60 damage when they were fully charged to the maximum. With the right reads, proper execution, and a stray crush counter here and there, some V-Triggers could put you in a position to lose rounds in which you had a 75% or greater life lead. Some top fighting game players even went so far to say that a game of Street Fighter V only ever truly begins when you have enough meter to activate V-Trigger. Casual fighting game players are probably looking at everything that I just laid out and probably aren't too much bothered by it. After all, they usually don't break these systems down like more serious fighting game fans do. But there was one thing, really I should say eight things, that most everyone agreed soured their experience of Street Fighter V. Shortly after SF5 was released, tech-savvy folks started to pick it apart. DisplayLag.com, a website dedicated to finding computer monitors and TVs with the lowest input lag, put Street Fighter V to the test and found that it took an astonishing 8 frames of gameplay for button presses to be realized in-game, likely due to a programming quirk of Unreal Engine 4. No game is going to be perfect in regards to input lag. Ultra Street Fighter 4 had about 5 frames of input lag itself. But when you begin encroaching on almost one-tenth of a second before your inputs register, especially in games where precision matters, like fighting games, things start to break down. Because of Street Fighter V's input lag problems at release, the gameplay issues that I listed before became even more apparent. Whiff punishing was just about non-existent, being reactionary in your gameplay was nearly impossible, and overall, the game just didn't feel as good to play. The general public and pro fighting game players hadn't been this down on Street Fighter in quite some time. Capcom was just whiffing on almost all aspects of their game, compounded by the fact that they were just not being very communicative with fans through all of these issues, which is kind of the point of a service-based title. So much so to the point that they actually apologized for staying so quiet. Capcom's road to redemption with Street Fighter V didn't start all that well either. In September 2016, right as Capcom was finishing up their first season of new character DLC, they released an update to bolster their anti-cheat system and make their game harder to hack. Sure, 
no problem. But in doing so, Capcom, and, and this is going to seem like a massive oversimplification, unintentionally inserted a piece of code into Street Fighter V that opened a back door to the most base level of your computer. If you want all of the nitty gritty details, I'll link a few stories in the description below, but I've heard this rootkit mishap described as potentially one of the dumbest, most potentially damaging infosec mishaps in the last decade. But this? This is like a whole different level of messing up. This is not input lag. This is not poor design. This is straight up ignorance giving malicious people possible access to your machine without telling you anything about it and without you having any way to stop them and without the vast majority of people who own this game even knowing what that means. Yeah, like, Capcom thankfully caught this after an uproar from the internet and rolled the patch back in about a day. But how can an entire team push a patch through without asking themselves, is putting Capcom.sys in System32 really a good idea? It's beyond me. But as the inevitable march of time continues on, so does Street Fighter V. They released their second round of DLC characters from December of 2016 to October of 2017. Capcom kept a pretty close eye on their game and issued a variety of balance patch updates every now and again, but at least according to popular opinion from a variety of professional fighting game players, Season 2 was probably the lowest point for the competitive scene. V-triggers that could rob rounds were more prominent than ever, some questionable balance choices left good, wholesome, honest Street Fighter characters like Ryu and Chun-Li in the dust, while those dastardly 50-50 centric characters like Ibuki and Rashid were running things. This was exacerbated by the fact that all invincible wake-up attacks now needed one stock of EX meter, even the ones that were free before, like Nikali and Ken's uppercuts. So if you really wanted relief from all of the pressure that Rainbow Mika and Nadeshko were putting on you, you need to pay the piper. But you know what? Season 2 wasn't all bad. Capcom was really starting to get the roster to a point where players could differentiate their playstyles from one person to another through character choice alone. They also nerfed anti-air jabs, weakened normal throws, and cut the infamous 8 frames of input delay down to 6.5. Season 3, however, was really when Street Fighter V began to come into its own. Because with the start of the next season of DLC, also came the most substantial update to Street Fighter V to date, entitled Street Fighter V Arcade Edition. A play on the fact that Capcom was finally adding a fully-fledged arcade mode to the game, as well as putting it into game centers around the world. SFV AE featured a brand new look, a team battle mode, a total rebalance of the entire roster so far, improvements to survival mode, and the addition of a second V-trigger for the rest of the cast. AE would also eventually feature the extra battle mode, a way for players to fight against computer-controlled characters in order to unlock bundles of fight money and experience, and some of the more extravagant costumes like Beautiful Rashid, Mecha Zangief, a Ghost and Goblins inspired costume for Ryu, boxers included, Captain Commando Nash, and many others. It can't all be positive though, Capcom did end up taking away all sources of fight money away from the completion of single player content like story mode, survival, and character stories. You could still get fight money through the experience points gained by completing these modes, but the amount of currency is paltry at best. But in order to bridge that gap, Capcom implemented weekly and daily missions that reward you with fight money if you hit a pretty easy to reach bar, typically upwards of 5,000 or so fight money a week by completing all of the missions available to you. Capcom also added a dreaded loot box system in their fighting chance mode, but I would like to note that it's a bit nicer than most other loot box systems because you don't spend real money to spin the wheel and you actually end up getting some nice costumes out of it. Well, I have money. Let's just spend a whole lot. Yo, are you kidding me? What? Oh man, I wish I used Vega. <laughs> wow. That sucks. I don't even use that character. <laughs> The addition of V-Trigger 2 was a particularly welcome one to the game, as it added some much-needed variety to every one of Street Fighter V's now very respectable roster of 32 characters at the end of Season 3, a far cry from the paltry 16 from launch. I also need to give Capcom props for the way they implemented the arcade mode to the game. 
they recreated the arcade mode path for each game in the series for every character, adding stand-ins where appropriate. You'd be awarded with a nice piece of art at the end of the journey, which is a neat way to demonstrate the history of Street Fighter as a series. Capcom was also finally able to excise their input lag demon from Street Fighter V, eventually getting the input lag down to about 5 frames, which is around the same as Street Fighter IV. Each Street Fighter before this one has made its mark in history in one way or another. But that begs the question, 10 years from now, how will we remember Street Fighter V? Well, my friends, are you ready to hear a Skip Bayless level hot take? Well, here it is. I think that Street Fighter V will go down as one of the most important Street Fighter games ever. <gasps> hey, I, t I told you it was a hot take. Now don't get me wrong, I don't think Street Fighter V's gameplay will put it into the Hall of Fame anytime soon. But the things that Capcom did to right the ship and sway public opinion back in its favor could end up being a blueprint for fighting game developers to follow for generations to come. Capcom's journey into the games as a service model has proven to be profitable. Monster Hunter World, a service-based title, is now Capcom's best-selling game of all time. And despite Street Fighter V's lower than average sales for a Street Fighter game only clocking in at about 2 million units as of late 2017, Capcom seems to feel justified in continuing support for this game by way of brand new characters, stages, systems, and features. No doubt due to the continuing sources of revenue this added content brings to Capcom. The story of Street Fighter V ends a little differently than my other two videos. Unlike Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite and Street Fighter Cross Tekken, both of which have seemed to fall in by the wayside, Street Fighter V is a story of redemption. Capcom admitted that the way they launched this game was not what the market was looking for at the time, and as an apology, they set on a multi-year improvement plan to get the Street Fighter series back on track. Reviews of Arcade Edition have eclipsed those of vanilla Street Fighter V, the game's reputation has improved in the online discourse, the content is much meatier, and the gameplay is leaps and bounds better than it was at launch. There are still some issues with Street Fighter V, of course. V-triggers are still quite overbearing, the neutral game still leaves something to be desired, and the netcode sure as hell ain't great. But we have the Capcom Cup Finals coming in December, so who knows, we could just be around the corner from another groundbreaking Season 4 announcement with even more substantial gameplay changes. So finally, with the ongoing success of the first service-based Street Fighter title, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Capcom will be looking to put some of the lessons they learned from this edition into future versions of the Street Fighter series. Hey everyone, thank you once again so much for watching this video. I wouldn't be able to do this without your support. Uh, I am going to be taking a small step back from the Capcom fighting game stories that I've been doing for the last three months. Uh, you can look forward to a game of the year list. Uh, in December, so look forward to that. In other news, I also have a Twitter account finally set up for this whole shindig. You can follow me on Twitter at StumblebeeTV. And once again, like always, you can follow me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash StumbleBee. I look forward to seeing you there. I try to stream at least once a week. And uh, if you want to ask me questions about this video, my other two videos, or any other thing that you want to ask me about, uh, that's where you can find me. So... I'll see y'all later. See y'all in December.